Hello and bienvenido San Antonio. Welcome to the Alamo Hour, discussing the people, places, and passion that make our city. My name is Justin Hill, a local attorney, a proud San Antonian, and keeper of chickens and bees. On the Alamo Hour, you'll get to hear from the people that make San Antonio great and unique and the best kept secret in Texas. We're glad that you're here. All right, welcome to this episode of the Alamo Hour. Today's guest is Javier Espinoza. Javier is a trial lawyer. Uh, he's an advocate for workers. He's a singer. I've seen him do a backflip, I think, or a front flip. I can't remember. Maybe a handspring. Was it a herky? It was one of those things. Backflip. Back, back <laughs> <laughs> Javier's handled all types of cases all over the state of Texas, but he's really kind of settled into a, uh, a focus on workers' rights, uh, not only in the courtroom, but he's an advocate for workers outside of the courtroom as well. Uh, he's handled some really high-profile high cases uh, here. And if you Google him, you'll see that there's been a bunch of stuff that's gone on in the last uh, year or so that we're going to talk about uh, involving him advocating for the rights of workers, not just laborers, but also people that work in government. So, Javier, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, we've, uh, we have we did a small little episode for my law firm earlier, so we're ready. We're warmed up. I'm going to start with some color commentary, a top 10 list I do with other people. We're good. How are you uh, doing, Justin? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, other than t you just told me I look old before we started, but you know, what are you going to do? I need to drink more water, I think. You look refined. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is that because there's a distiller on next? I look like I have fermented. All right. Uh, top 10 list with Javier Espinoza. Javier, when and why did you move to San Antonio, Texas? We moved to San Antonio, Texas in July of 2007, and I had been practicing in El Paso for five years prior to that. And the main, main reason is because my wife wanted to go to law school, and that's the deal we had made. Was well, so I went to law school, then she went to law school. And when I moved to El Paso with the family, there was no law school in El Paso. So we had to pick a, a, a landing place, and uh, there was a few options, and San Antonio was definitely at the top of my list uh, because I knew the next move was probably going to be permanent. And it wasn't where you went to law school, which is in kind of a terrible town. I'm not saying terrible law school, but Lubbock is, you know, it's not much pumpkin. I was out there recently. Um, we're all doing our part right now, um, you know, eat local, help local, support local. Uh, are you doing any restaurants that you're doing takeout from or trying to help out or just any that you've generally realized, oh, I'm, I'm frequenting this one a lot? Um, you know, we've actually been cooking at home a lot. Well, I say we, and my wife would kill me if she heard me say we. Okay. Uh, she's been cooking a lot at the house, and You've my kids eating. have been cooking. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've been eating a lot, and I, it's it's been tough on me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we did we did Soluna to go last night. I know that's one of your favorite restaurants. Oh my god, yeah. we've done that. You know, we did actually Fruteria, where we did okay. the uh, to go uh, pepino margaritas, and uh, oh my god, I've that's seen delicious. you there. You know, I've seen you there having those, and you've never invited me to have one with you. Have it's, you? it's a strange thing. I will, but have you ever had them? Of course I have. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So one that, of my that, favorite. That is my favorite drink anywhere in the world. Okay. It is the pepino margaritas from Fruteria. So I, I, I've got a good story I'll tell you afterwards about those margaritas. But one funny story about the Fruteria is one of our good friends who you know is a lawyer in town. And her and I were going to meet and talk about some cases. She helps me on some, uh, some car wreck stuff from like, time to time and – I said, let's meet at Fruteria for lunch. And she said, okay. And she shows up and she's frazzled and she's sweating and she's real <laughs> stressed out. And I was like, what is wrong? She said, well, you told me to meet you at Fruteria. And I Googled it and there's like 60 Fruterias in San Antonio. <laughs> and she, then she like said she went and this was, she found one that was close to the office, then went to each of their websites. If they had websites and found one with a menu Instead of just calling me and asking me, but I thought that was always pretty funny. Okay, um, hidden gems in San Antonio. Anything that you really find particularly intriguing or nice in, in, in our city that you share with people that isn't the normal tourist trap? Um, I like Costa Pacifica a lot. Okay. Uh, it's a pretty cool restaurant, a lot of uh, Mex Mexican-style uh, seafood. Is it up Blanca? Uh, it's on 1604 and kind of by Blanco. Okay. 1604 Sto between Stone Oak and Blanco. Okay. Uh, uh, it's pretty good. And then on Thursday nights and Friday nights, they have music, uh, live music. So you sit on the patio and have a, a margarita, have seafood and listen to music. Have you ever sang? Not there. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, another time. Um, since you're a lawyer, I've asked, I asked Michael Watts this recently, who's the best lawyer you ever saw in trial? I ever saw in trial. And what made him good? Um, 
You know, my old partner and mentor, uh, Sam Legate, okay. uh, I tried a few cases with him. And Sam has a way of connecting with juries where he doesn't shout, he doesn't get angry, he doesn't, uh, he just talks to them. And he would stand up there and he would talk to them. And uh, I just really, really, really loved his style uh, in that sense. And so actually somebody I've seen in action, Sam Legate from El Paso. There's something to be said with just being the reasonable one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if people forget that and think that what we do is, you know, I always liked Matlock. I thought Matlock <laughs> had a very good affect. Well, you know, he was he's very observant and he's very introspective. And so he he actually taught me a lot in the sense that he says, don't look at, at the way you're looking at things. Look at the way that you believe the jury would be looking at things. Don't look at the way that okay. an attorney living in your house looks at things. Look at the way that if your juror is a mechanic – it has to go work 60, 70 hours in a garage, in the heat, whatever. Think about the way they would look at this case. Sure. And how do you connect to that? That's hard to do. It is. Yeah. And, and, and But he was very, very good at that. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that, that was very impressive. Um, there's a lawyer I like to listen to, and he always says, on my tough cases, I just have to think, why am I right and why are they wrong? And he said he spends a ton of time trying to figure out that question because that's what a jury is going to try to figure out. Why, why are they right or why are they wrong? Um, part of your background is when you were in college, you worked at a rental car counter is my understanding. Um, I know some of the things that I have done with rental cars, um, and they've probably been very tame with some of the craziest things you've seen people do to <laughs> rental cars. Well, instead of what they do to <laughs> or in rental cars, let me tell you a, a tip on how to, how to get a better rental car. Okay. All right. <laughs> So what I do, having been in the industry, is I always book an economy car or a compact car because that's the <laughs> cheapest one, right? And so what I do is I get up to the counter and, and you know, you befriend the person there. And, oh, yeah. how are you doing? Things, whatever. Hey, buddy, um, you know, you got a full size for another five bucks. And what we, the way we worked is you would get a commission based on any upsells. So if okay. you came to my counter and you were booked on a economy for 22 bucks and I could put you into a full size for 30 bucks a day, I'm making you spend $8 more per day. If okay. I can sell you the insurance, <clears throat> I get a commission off that. If I can show you, sell you the gas, just bring it back empty. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll fill it for you. Okay. All of that goes into the commission for the salesman. Huh. If they are on a commission based system, which most of them are. And so they would rather have the extra upsell of five bucks a day than nothing. Huh. They would rather have, you know, the, the, anything you can throw and at them. Do they have kind of free reign on what to do with the cars in the lot? Most of them do. Okay. All right. That's why a lot of times, you know, I, I go up and I say, uh, you know, they say, oh, you, you're reserving a compact. Would you like something bigger? I say, well, do you have anything available? And they say, yes. Well, what do you have in the compact? And a lot of times they don't because they've sold out of the cheapest vehicles first, right? Yeah. So, no, nah, I'm good with what I've got. So they've got to give you the free upgrade anyway. And so you uh, end up in a full size for a compact price because they sold out of the compacts. And so we used to do that all the time. I we, like we, how much detailed instruction <laughs> we just got on how to upgrade our <laughs> rental car. This, hey, you said you want to make sure people leave with a useful piece of information. That's one. Yeah, for sure. How and many so are you going to get? Three today? Um, at, three, at least three morsels. Okay. Of, of, all right. So that, that's definitely one because I'm going to use that. <laughs> Um, if you were not a lawyer, what would you be doing? I'd be an architect probably. Okay. All right. You have a, you have a real artistic brain. Um, I started out as an art major okay. uh, on an art scholarship when I first went to community college and, um, and I thought I was going to be drop. an artist. You know, I've got a music, a love of music. My, my brothers and I all play guitar instruments and stuff and we sing and we, we, we're not any good, but we do it. Well, okay. some of my brothers are very good. I'm not very good, but we do it. How many it. brothers do you have? I have three brothers. Okay. I have an older brother and two younger brothers. And all of us are musicians. All right. Um, and so when we get together, I've got a whole music room, you know, with my bass and drums and guitar. Well, not drums, but the, 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 the uh, a percussion. A drum machine? Well, it's a percussion system. It's like, you know what a cajon is? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> the look in your it's eyes. Family friendly. It's funny. Uh, uh, affair here. Yeah. <laughs> a cajon is just a box that you sit on and you tap it, and you've got the bass and the mm. little. Okay. It's used a lot in in, in Latin music. Um, so we've got, I've got that the cajon, and I've got the the little con congas, and, okay. and and so you know I've got the bass, the guitar, the everything. All right. We think we're a band, and so my my goal in life from a musical aspect is to be the guy with a band at Costa Pacifico. <laughs> When you go on Thursdays and you listen, I don't, I don't <laughs> rarely go up that far to eat, but if you're going to be playing a cajon, I'm going to go. Well, that's, that's my goal. As far as my music aspirations. Will you have like a, a hat people can put money in? <laughs> Maybe depends how good we are. All right. Um, 
this is a perfect segue. Who would you compare your singing voice to? God bless. God bless. I don't know that I can find somebody <laughs> bad enough. <laughs> And I only say this because we had a short discussion a couple of weeks ago about microphones and you said, no, I want it to record music. And so I thought, okay. You know, um, with computers nowadays, there's a little thing called auto-tune. Yeah, apparently uh, <laughs> um, Post Malone's really into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so if I sing horribly, the computer can make me sound great. But if you hear me in my living room, then, you know, I'm not going to sound very good. Okay. Uh, unless we've been... In my car, I sound drinking. fantastic when the music's really loud. No <laughs> the more I find me. that the more I drink, the better I sound. Yeah, I think that's just true. Did you, uh, as an aside, did you watch Post Malone's Nirvana concert? No, I did not. It was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Are you a Nirvana fan? I am a Nirvana fan, and I, and I, I know who Post Malone is, but I'm not a huge Post Malone fan. Yeah, I'm not a Post Malone fan at all. I mean... I know who he is just because he's got a bunch of popular songs, but it's fantastic. He clearly is a humongous Nirvana fan and he tries to do justice to Nirvana's albums and it really is good. Oh. And it raised six million, ten million dollars for COVID relief or something. I mean, it, it was super successful. The Blink 182 drummer was the drummer on it and they played it like in Zoom. It really is, it's worth the hour. I got to go check it out. Yeah, it's worth the time. It's probably not the type of music I normally listen to, but I got to go check I it mean, out. I mean, I even saw some judges posting on. Houston, Harris County judges posting on Facebook about how oh, much wow. they liked it. Yeah. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge facing our city is? Getting out of this, uh, reopening the economy with, uh, safely. Um, Outside of our current shutdown predicament. What is our biggest? Um, I think the digital gap, which has been really, really exacerbated. highlighted yeah. Yeah, by, by this COVID deal. You know, when you've got, and I'll tell you, you know, we live always, we live in the Northeast side. And when my kids in second grade were turning in document, uh, their homework through um, Google Docs, through yeah. PowerPoint presentations, how can somebody way in the South or somebody in a, a low income side of town that doesn't have internet at home, doesn't have a laptop, how can they compete? Yeah. You know, when they get through high school and, and they just have a really, really minimal understanding of the digital world, um, I think that is going to be the biggest uh, game changer from a, a education standpoint. Because it's yeah. not really just going to be education. It's going to be, do you know digital? I mean, think about this. We're doing a podcast. We were just talking about your little digital thing here. Uh, if you don't have a minimal understanding of digi the digital world, how can you even do this podcast? Right. Um, and so that's what I think the, the biggest challenge is. Yeah, and, and San Antonio has got the strange element of you've got like the rural southeast east side, rural, and then you've got low, so, low socioeconomic that sort of kind of covers a large swath of the city than maybe other than maybe the pizza slice going straight north of downtown. So you've got digital divide from access to internet, digital divide from access to equipment. You've kind of got this strange thing. but I think if there's anything that we could do to make a difference, it would be to give free internet to everybody mm -hmm. and uh, devices at least a certain amount yeah check out devices you know we uh our law firms help and work with a ged program here right now and they are providing laptops to take home because they can't come into classes so they're doing zoom classes and they ha they have access to refurbished laptops for 150 bucks wow. so i mean it's not a hurdle that makes it insurmountable for schools or nonprofits to provide it's just got to be a focus yeah for sure do you do any Fiesta stuff? And if so, what is your favorite? Um, we really only do the King William Fair. Okay. Uh, and, and King William's of, winning this one by like 50%. Oh, yeah? yeah? Well, I think it's, it's family friendly. You know, probably the majority of the guests you've had are have families. And so yeah, I'll, I'll share, you know, when we first got here in 2007, I heard a lot about uh, Oyster Bake. Okay. And so I took my, at the time, I guess she would have been seven um, seven, nine, and 10 year old to oyster bake thinking, oh man, you know, I've heard a lot about it. So we go and my wife's at St. Mary's law school. So maybe we'll see her studying there for her finals. <laughs> it got crazy <laughs> real quick. <laughs> I was like, this is not a place for a seven, nine and a 10 year old. And so we left real quick. And that's probably why so ever since then, it's like, what's family friendly. And the King William fair has been pretty family yeah. friendly. Every Early. Year. Yeah, yeah, we go, you know, 11 o'clock. The pooch you know. parade is family, friend, fr family cool. friendly. It's people dress their dogs up in costumes and walk down the street. Well, I'd be afraid my family would dress me up. And <laughs> Some of the owners also dress up. <laughs> and also down. the arts fair is a fantastic family friendly. I think it's my favorite, the arts fair. The arts fair? Yeah. I, it, I haven't been to that it's one. It's the first weekend. It's like 
early in the day. So everybody's still excited. People aren't hung over yet. People are, it's just a neat event. And there's a big kids area where kids can go do art all day. Well, and I'll share it with you, you know, I have a lot of people that call me and, and ask me about San Antonio. And I, I regularly remind people, understand, be patient with me. I've only been here 12 years. Uh, people think I've been here all my life, and, yeah. I, and I haven't. I love this city. When did you move here? 2007. Same as me. When? What month? Uh, July 2007. Huh, me too. Yeah, wow. Do you know what day? Look, look Actually, I moved, here in, I moved here in July. I closed on a house in June, moved in July. But I will tell you the difference between you and I. <laughs> I had three kids, <laughs> three okay. little kids. All right. So I wasn't out looking for the party places, for the fun places. I was looking at, I got to make a living. I got to, you know, what's the best school for my kids? Uh, support my wife, whatever, you know, going through through, through those things. And How so do you I, know I was looking for the party places? I just, I, I'm assuming. I was trying to find somebody <laughs> to like, uh, you know, I don't know. It was the first time I owned a house. Speaking you know. of, you know, I, I you're going to be a father soon. So yeah. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's that exciting. will definitely change your world. I hope so. Um, and, and, and in twenty, in what twelve years, somebody's going to ask you. So, what are the fun places in San Antonio? You're going to say the Duceum, <laughs> <laughs> the Kids Museum. You know the. Uh, uh, Easy's has kids. free kids eat on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know it's 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 funny we bring this up. So we both moved here the same month and the same year. We both were in the same office at one point. Both of us had kind of the same beginning office, and that's only unique because it's such a. Odd, weird location. <laughs> we were in an office building. We were in the upstairs above a woman who lived downstairs in a house. <laughs> yeah. That's Behind Rosario's. Yeah. Right? Strange. Yeah. I know. We're, we're kindred. <laughs> it was meant to be. Okay. Currently, what do you love most about living in this city? Um, number one, the greenery, the hills, the, the river. Uh, but more than anything, really just the people, man. The people are super cool. Anywhere yeah. you go, you, you, you say hello. You, I mean, you make friends everywhere you yeah. go. You talk to people, hey, what are you doing? And what's that? And nobody's afraid of you. Nobody's like, what the heck are you doing talking to me? You know, it's just a very friendly yeah. city. Um, we go bike riding. And before you know it, we've made friends with other bikers. And, you know, we go to listen to music at Costa Pacifico or anywhere else. And before you know it, you've made friends with the table next to you. And you're buying them a drink. New Orleans is the only place I've ever been that has that you make friends just randomly wherever you go. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't want to live in New Orleans, but But it sure is. But fun it's that place has that it has that feel. People <laughs> everybody's friends. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing, you know, you go to New Orleans, it's got a very unique culture um to New Orleans that is very different from anywhere else. Yeah. You come to San Antonio, it's so unique. You know, you go to El Paso, Dallas, Austin, Houston, the the bigger cities, none of them are like San Antonio. What did Mark Twain say that there are only four unique American cities? And I think it's San Francisco, San Antonio, New Orleans, and Boston. That's what Mark Twain said. We're the only oh. unique American cities. I don't disagree with him. Yeah, I mean, I've never been to Boston, actually. <laughs> I have. Okay. And it is a very cool city. Yeah. Um, um, all those cities are cool. Uh, although, I don't know that I agree that it's such a unique culture. It's definitely different but it's not maybe in mark twain times 100 years ago it probably was very different true yeah true but san francisco is there's nothing like san francisco if you've never seen the fog racing into san francisco and think oh my god the city's on fire because you just have no there is no way to describe what that looks like if you're watching it come in it looks like a fire is overtaking the city and it's just the daily fog oh, it's awesome and to ride to the trolleys you know yeah. to Go over the Golden Gate Bridge to Sasalito. That's it's it's a it's a definitely a very unique. Although I, I still my favorite city in the world is New York City. Okay. Um, have you? I'm sure yeah. you've gone there and been there a bunch of times. Yeah. But, um, New York City to me is is the the best city in the world, and a big part of that is the multiculturalism that exists sure. in New York City. And even that, you know, to, to say about San Antonio, I love San Antonio, the Hispanic culture in San Antonio, but I do wish it was a little more diverse, um, like Houston. Yeah, you I mean, know, Houston's super diverse. Yeah, I yeah. go to Houston. You know, you go somewhere, you may be served by a Peruvian and a German, and you know, it, it's so diverse. And here, it's very Hispanic or white. Mm -hmm. And I, I love our city, obviously, and I love that it's Hispanic. But I was raised in Odessa, Texas, which was very, very conservative, Republican, Anglo, and very minimal Hispanic when I was there. Now it's 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 a lot a, a majority Hispanic uh, uh, town. Even Odessa was that white. Odessa was very white. I mean, I would think Midland, but no, Odessa was okay. very, very white. Yeah, it was a lot of oil field, and 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 uh, it was very, very um, difficult growing up there. To be honest with I'm you, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, being an immigrant, uh, I didn't speak any English when I started at school, and my my teacher, Mrs. Gaines, was an Anglo lady that didn't speak any Spanish. 
Uh, and spent, there probably was no ESL program then. No, not at all. Yeah. I spent a lot of times in the corner, um, you know, reading, uh, drawing <laughs> and coloring, which thank God, because it taught me a lot of art skills. <laughs> well, so, I, and I want to ask you about that. Um, I told you before you'd be on here, I was going to read everything in the sort of public realm about you, <laughs> which uh, surprisingly, there's a lot. Uh, there's quite a bit of about you and your upbringing out there, but, um, and, and you've brought it up. You were born in Odessa? No, I was born in Juarez, okay. Mexico. All right. Um, talk about when you went to, to to Odessa, growing up in Odessa. And that is a very unique American experience, but it is not unique to Javier Espinoza. It's unique to a lot of people, but people like me have no way to relate to that because the system speaks English, you know? Right. So talk to me about living in Odessa and, and learning English sort of in that system where you've got to feel kind of like an alien. So, so let me back back up a little bit to give you an interesting, fun story. Yeah. All right. So the way that we came to the United States, my family with my dad, goes back all the way to the Mexican Revolution. So huh. my, my dad is uh, was from a little ranch down in Jalisco, Mexico, um, uh, Guacasco, Jalisco, tiny little ranch. My great great grandfather uh, fought in the Mexican Revolution, and he and a fellow, a few fellow re revolutionaries. Took over the haciendas and they, you know, they they killed. The, it's my understanding they killed the haciendados and they gave all the food to the people and they did what the Mexican revolutionaries were doing. Yeah. So the federales started chasing them and so he packed up his little stuff and they headed north and they went all the way to Denver, Colorado, and they had huh. my grandma. My <clears throat> grandma was born in Denver, Colorado. When the Mexican Revolution's over, everything cools down. They go back down to the little ranch. He has a little truck and he. You know, has so from hotel. Denver. Yeah, from back Denver, down. they go back down. To, to, to the little ranch where, you know, they're racing stuff. So my dad is born there. Uncles are born there. Everybody's born in Mexico in, in that little ranch. My grandfather gets married to my grandma, and my grandfather would laugh, would tell me that his friends would tell him, do you know what you have there? You've got gold. Your wife was born in the U.S. She's a U.S. citizen. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so uh, we would crack up. But that is how th they gathered all their little things they got all their stuff. They went to Juarez, which was the border town with El Paso, north. And through my grandmother that had been born in the U.S., somebody had to go find the birth certificate. They uh. paid somebody. They brought it back. She applied for residency, then citizenship. Then my grand, my dad got his papers because he was born to a U.S. Yeah. citizen. And, and so it goes all the way back to the Mexican Revolution, right? But my grandfather and my grandmother were very, very poor, very humble. Um, they didn't have a lot. They go to get to Juarez. They have 12 kids. All of them are working class. Uh, and, and, you know, they tell stories. It wasn't as it is now today. So this is your dad or mom? My dad. Okay. And so they would cross over the river almost every day to come work over here. My grandma would clean houses. So even though they could come to the U.S., they were still living in, in, in Juarez when my dad started, you know, becoming of age. And my dad was actually a very good soccer player. We have newspaper huh. clippings of him playing for the state of Chihuahua. He was like a little star okay and uh he sold drugs for uh not not drugs he <laughs> sold let me pharmaceuticals truly pharmaceuticals let me PEDs? no no to the soccer team <laughs> no 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 True they were all 220 <laughs> it was the national association of drug whatever and he would go to the different pharmacies and he would okay. sell the pharmaceuticals to the pharmacies did very well um but he would tell me he says you know i i looked at my life and that's when i had you and i had my my older brother who's three years older than me and he says, you know, I looked at my life and I thought, I'm never going to get anywhere. And I would look at friends that would go to the north and go to the U.S. And I would see them even working in construction that were doing better than I was yeah. doing in a suit selling, you know, these pharmaceuticals. So he and my mom decided to cut him to El Paso. We moved to El Paso when I was four years old. And uh, we stayed there a few months. And then uh, my uncle drew him over to Odessa, Texas, where the oil boom was going on. And that's when the early, uh, this would have been in 79, I was about to 80. say before the tank in the early yes. 80s. Yes, yeah. when it was still booming. And my dad tells me, you know, they would. we went to Odessa. He goes, man, I remember I got into a fight with one of my supervisors, like not a physical fight, but a verbal fight. I quit and I walked across the street and got a job getting a dollar with a dollar, getting paid a dollar Jeez. more. That's how work, there was yeah. just work everywhere. And so we Which go. out in that part of Texas, that's it's always like that. It's up and it's down, up and, up and, down. and down. Up and, and down. when it's up, it's up. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so we went there. He started working in construction, and and um, 
when we first got there, we lived in a little little shack, and and and, and it would be um, it, it's 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 interesting because I actually just went two weeks ago to film a commercial at that little house. Really? Yeah. Cool. And, and it's gonna come out in the next couple. Talking about of weeks. your upbringing and all that. Yeah, just yeah. kind of saying you know we lived in this little house when we first came to to, to the U.S. And, and really, what I'm trying to do is tell kids in Odessa. The, in Odessa. Okay. And, and really, what I'm trying to do is tell kids if if I did it, you can do it. Yeah. If I'm here, you can be here. Um, and, and so anyway, we got to Odessa. I didn't speak any English. My brother didn't speak any English. My parents didn't speak any English. And they were very hard workers. Um, you know, we live in this tiny little town, in this tiny little house on the south side of Odessa, the south side of the tracks, where if you look it up, you can Google it if you don't believe me. In the early 1980s, Odessa had a higher crime rate per capita than New York City. Huh. And it was like... It was pretty bad. It I also remember. had a Rolls Royce dealership back then. In too. Midland, yeah, Midland had a I mean, Rolls. It was just such have a you weird read Friday area. Night Lights? Uh, yeah, of course. So yeah. Friday Night Lights is about my high school, Permian yeah. High School. You're right, and, I, and we ended up going across the tracks. My dad worked his work tail off and, and got us were to. Were those the during the, the heydays when you were there, though? It, it was the year that they won the state championship. So the book is Midland about, or Odessa? No, Odessa. Okay. So the book is about 1989. Okay. And that's where my brother went. And actually one of the lawyers in that book, Brian Chavez, is a really good friend of mine now. Huh. And he went to Harvard, then went to law school. And he, he that's 1989. They win the state championship. Then when I get in there in 1990, they are uh, caught cheating. And they're <laughs> not allowed to defend their championship. So then 1991, I think they get pretty far as well. Uh, and they win it or something like that. I, it's something along those lines that it's been a long time ago. But... Uh, Definitely, uh, if you read Friday Night Lights, it's going to tell you a lot about the racism um, that existed, unfortunately, yeah. in Odessa. And it wasn't just against the blacks. Yeah. Uh, and so growing up, you know, that, that was, I was very race conscious because uh, I remember, you know, being in seventh grade and having the huge, the biggest crush on this girl, April. And I remember asking her to go to the mall <laughs> with me. Every and, small town in Texas had an April. <laughs> in April. Well, she was beautiful. <laughs> and, and I remember her telling me, uh, my dad would never let me go with a Mexican. Mm. I said, like, well, well, don't tell him you're going with a Mexican. <laughs> that was my response. <laughs> what tell him my name's John. <laughs> you know? and, and Odessa's got to be very heavily Hispanic now. Now? Yeah. Back then it wasn't, yeah. but now, now it is. Um, but, you know, I grew up with that. I remember being in sixth grade and getting into a fight because... The guy called me a Mexican, mm -hmm. and he was like, "You Mexican," and I just remember started swinging. And that's, those were fighting words, calling you Mexican. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you know what's funny is that when I finally came to UT Austin, met my wife. My wife was from Eagle Pass, so she was raised in a majority Hispanic yeah. town. And I remember telling her that story, and she goes, "Have you looked in the mirror? You are Mexican." <laughs> I thought, "Am I am I completely culturally insensitive?" Because I'm thinking, "What's the big deal?" <laughs> and so I was telling her, "Well, that would be like a very chauvinist man telling you, but." You're a woman. How can you do that if you're a woman? It's not a compliment. Yeah. And it's not an observation. And so for us, you know, it was definitely a put down to be called that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, you know, growing up through all that, uh, uh, you know, seeing my parents struggle, seeing my, my older brother got married at 17, um, had a, was a father by 18. Um, the goal for us growing up was if you can finish high school, you've made it. Yeah. You know, you, you, you graduate high school, you've made it. Um, and, and so kind of growing up in that, you asked me at the very beginning, how did you end up in San Antonio? And I told you the, the, the elevator version. The real version is this. When I was in high school, I had absolutely no plans to go to college because once I graduated high school, I'm done. Yeah. But I always did well in school. I was in honors classes. I loved to read and, and I just enjoyed school. I love learning. But I remember coming home one day and being you know, sitting there watching the news with my dad. And I saw this good-looking, articulate, smart Hispanic named Henry Cisneros. Okay. And this guy is talking, and the mayor of San Antonio, and he's saying... Was he I, the mayor then? or Yeah, HUD? he was the mayor okay. then. Right. It was before the whole blow-up, right? Yeah. It was, it was his, man, but he was he HUD was, also, right? Well, it was HUD under after. Clinton? Yeah, yeah, okay. he was HUD under Clinton yeah. as well. But when I saw him, he was mayor, and, and I remember looking and thinking, holy cow, a Mexican can be a, a, a <laughs> mayor of a, of a major city? Yeah. Like, look at this guy. I mean, having been raised in Odessa, all of our leaders were Anglo and yeah, male. Yeah, of course. There was no female leadership, no Hispanic leadership, Very maybe one token African-American. Um, and so nobody that looked like me I, that I had ever seen in that kind of role. Yeah. 
And, and I can tell you that was transformational in my life. Huh. To see somebody that looked like me and, and, and be so articulate, so smart, so sharp. I remember thinking, San Antonio, I want to live in San Antonio someday. Huh. Cool. I want to be in San Antonio someday. Um, because I want to, if, if you can be that in San Antonio, I want to, excuse me, I want to be that. Because I didn't feel like I could be that in Odessa. So that is the long way no, around great. that I and got little did you know at the time, like, I mean, we've been through a series of Hispanic, African-American, female, Jewish, white. I mean, w our mayor, I mean, really, it, it's surprisingly has run the gamut in all kinds of uh, diversity contexts. Which is great. Yeah, awesome. it is great. That's why I love San Antonio. Because if you go and Google how many mayors Odessa has had. <laughs> what about El Paso, though? El Paso was pretty Hispanic, but even in a... El Paso is probably about 90% Hispanic, yeah. but even in, in a 90% Hispanic town, when I got there in 2002 as an attorney, the main firms were, were Sherla Gate, Mound Screen, Meyer, Safi, and Galatson, <laughs> uh, Ray Valdez, McChristian, and Jeans, has some Hispanic names at least, uh, Scott Holtz, but that, that was Jeff Ray's Smith. Firm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so even in a 90% Hispanic town, the majority of the firms were not Hispanic. Or not owned by Hispanics, yeah. not not led by Hispanics. Well, so many lawyers come about being a lawyer because it's a family thing too. I th I think that's less our generation, but I think the older generations, it was oh your granddad was and now your dad is and now you're going to be and yeah. I think that probably fed a lot of that El Paso stuff. Um, you ended up in a, in Odessa. We've kind of long way, short way, long way again. Uh, you end up in Odessa, not speaking English. Uh, you sort of work through that system. At some point, you end up at UT Austin, but it wasn't necessarily an easy route for you to get to UT. I mean, it's a lot. Look, UT is one of the best schools in Texas, period. So it's even a longer route for a guy coming from Odessa, sort of from a marginalized community. Um, had you always wanted to go to UT? What was sort of the plan? How'd you end up at UT? I, when I was in high school, uh, a bunch of my friends or a bunch of guys that I would see in, in my classes had UT hats. I was like, what, what, what is UT? What That's is cool. that Longhorn? Yeah, like, oh, oh best, best school, whatever, right? So I went to my counselor when I made the decision to go to college. And I was like, hey, you know, I'd like to go to college. What do you suggest? Uh, I've heard about UT. And she said, you know, I think that uh, for you, the, the best thing to do is start at Odessa Community College. <laughs> and uh, that, that probably would be good. Okay. And, and I thought, okay, you know, so I went to UT, uh, to community college, made almost straight A's, very good grades. I went to a counselor and I told her, hey, I've always heard about UT. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a great school. This is how crazy it is, Justin. I was two years into community college, right, when I'm finally thinking about, okay, I got to go to a big university now. I had no idea where UT was because <laughs> all I had ever heard was UT. It's UT, <laughs> UT. Yeah. And so this counselor first tells me, well, it's in Austin. You know, like, do you know how far it is? You know how to get there? Because yeah. it was before Google Maps. And probably people hearing this are going to be MapQuest was around. <laughs> no, On not even back then. We didn't have cell phones. What I'm, year was this? I'm talking about 2005. Yeah, you had to print oh, them sorry, up. I'm sorry, 1995. Yeah, you could print them up. And it would have, like, all these turns. Maybe, quest, but you know? I didn't have a computer at home. I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't even have a pager back right. then. So you I, had an almanac. Yeah. Well, right. essentially, I, I, I'm not joking. I had When I got my car, I bought a map of Texas. Yeah. And I would follow the map of Texas. And yeah. when I got to Austin, I went to a store and bought a map of Austin. And I learned how to use, like, how to guide myself through Austin yeah. from a map of Austin. So this was, I didn't have a cell phone until probably, like, 97, maybe. Uh, was my first cell phone yeah. in 96. I was fortunate enough to have a beeper. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> um, so so anyway, you know, so I, 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 I go to the counselor and I was like, this is what I've always heard. I've always seen Austin. Never in my walls, just imagination that I ever think they were going to turn me down. Thank God they didn't. You know, I applied and that was the only school I applied. Oh, I thought you were going to be like, they turned me down three times <laughs> yeah, and no. I stuck to it. No, you know, but it's crazy now because like when I told my kids, I was like, look, get your A, a school, get your B school, get sure. your Z school. Yeah. Have your backup plan. I had no backup plan. I only plan. applied to A&M for undergrad. But it goes back to kind of our upbringing and, you know, another thing that that, that I want to talk to whoever's listening, right? Yeah. I think that I made a lot of mistakes in my life, and I, there's a lot of things that I would have done different if I had a mentor, if I had a good mentor sure. that would have guided me. And I think that's what's lacking in a lot of kids that are raised in low socioeconomic households. You know, and, and I used to think it was race-based. It's not race-based. You can be a poor white kid and have every disadvantage that my 
well-to-do Hispanic kid will not have. That's exactly right. And, and so it doesn't matter what your race is, but it does matter what your parents do, what your socioeconomic standing is. You can be white, Chinese, black, brown. What you've matter. seen in your outer circles. Even, you know, the people that y'all go to a barbecue with once in a blue moon. Did their kid go to college? Okay, that's somebody I can at least ask questions about. Right. Yeah. And if you don't have that circle of mentors, it's it's ridiculous. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I didn't feel the effect of that till I, I when I <clears throat> go to law school, graduate, go go um, work at Shirley Gate in El Paso. Jim Sher, Sam Legate were the main partners of that firm. Very uh, awesome, amazing attorneys. Legendary. Amazing people. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're amazing. Great mentors. They're still, Sam is one of my best friends still. I just talked to him two days ago and I asked him for advice. Jim Sher, I call him and any anything I need, I'm, you know, whatever. But my point being that when I was there three years um, and I'd done very well, thank God, and, and done very well in my jury trials and, and made a bunch of money for him, um, we talked about partnership. And so they said, okay, we're going to we're gonna talk about your partnership. Um, we're going to meet at this restaurant tonight, uh, be there at 7, whatever. So I get there at 6.30. You know, I'm out in the park. What restaurant? Uh, it was the Greenery okay. at, at Sunland Park Mall. And, and I still remember <laughs> that it was raining that night because I was sitting outside my vehicle and I'm just sitting there. And I got there 30 minutes early. I'm super nervous. I've never been in this situation before. Sure. So I pull up my flip phone <laughs> at the time. A razor? <laughs> it, something like that. Yeah. It was a Samsung or something. So I, I pull up my flip phone and I start going through my contacts. And I want to call somebody. Like, who do I ask for advice? Who do I ask for advice? And I went through every single contact. I mean, if I call my dad, he's going to tell me I'm going to pray for you, dad, son. Yeah. But he can't give me any advice. Sure. He's been a construction worker with a ninth grade education all his life. In this situation, and and I remember going through, and the only two mentors in this new world that I had stepped into were sitting in that restaurant, or were going to uh. be sitting in that restaurant, and uh, and because of that, I've learned the value of mentors. Yeah, you know, and and every time I've made a huge, huge decision, depending what part of my life it is, I, I've sought out mentors. So how'd the meeting go? Um, it went well. Okay, it went well. I got offered partnership after three years. Okay, um, you know we we, we worked towards a, a good agreement that I kind of walked away from when I moved to San Antonio. Yeah, but but at least I was offered partnership. Is that all positive when you left? No. Okay. <laughs> well, that's part of the deal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I don't. Things. We could talk about sort of how you got to where you are a long time, but I think it's really important. You said you you're even considering starting maybe a podcast or some sort of question and answer for people that want mentoring, something that just sort of opens up the possibilities for people that have that phone with no names in it, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, we've talked about it uh, a little bit so far, but one of your main focuses right now is on the job injuries, representing workers. Um, you currently were involved in representing a bunch of La Cantera employees. And the suit was based on the idea or the premise that they were told they couldn't speak Spanish at work, right? Correct. Um, talk to us about how did you get into, and not how did you get into, but why do you feel such a passion about representing workers, people that are injured on the job, and sort of that entire class of blue-collar worker? Um, you know, before I went to UT Austin, I worked in construction with my dad. Um, I installed sprinkler systems all through under uh, all through high work. school. It is man yeah. digging those ditches, um, and then every I would do that through high school. I would I would install sprinkler systems with Mister Morris, who was one of, he was one of my teachers, but he also had a side business okay. going on. Um, and then during the summers, I would work in construction with my dad, and I just remember working in Midland at these really high end you know, uh, buildings and walking into the elevator and then having these people in business suits walk in, you know, these very nice looking ladies smelling very nice or well, they walk in in their nice business suits. And my God, the way they would look down on us, yeah. the way that they, that just that feeling was horrible, horrible. Or we'd be working, you know, we'd be working in a building and painting or whatever we're doing. And then my dad would tell me, wait, wait, no, here comes the, here comes the owner, here comes the boss or whatever, you know. And, and my, I remember watching my dad go to the corner and just kind of put his head down. And so I would do the same. I'd go over there next to him and I just kind of put my head down and look at the people, inspect our work and do whatever they're going to do. If they addressed us, we would address them. If they didn't address us, they'd just walk out and wouldn't even acknowledge us. Jeez. And, and growing up with that and finding when I found my voice and I found who I was and I kind of got a little bit of self-confidence, uh, I remember thinking, like, that's bullshit. Yeah. You know, why are you treating people like that? Why are you firing them because you don't like whatever, you know, because they told you something's wrong and, and you have the right to fire them. You 
abuse them. You you don't follow the law. Sure. Um, and so when I went to work in El Paso at Shirley Gate, I started seeing a lot, some of those workers come in. And I remember I wasn't very passionate about the other kind of work, but when it came to workers being abused in any way, shape or form, man, I would see them and I would see them sitting there and, and I would see my aunt Alicia. I would yeah. see my dad, Jose. You know, I would see my uncle Alfredo. And I would think I would never let anybody talk to my dad the way this guy's talked to them. I would never let anybody talk to my uncle the way that this guy has been treating him. And so I really, really became passionate about fighting for these yeah. workers. Uh, Personal then, connection. Yeah, because at the end of the day, man, all they're doing is they're trying to make a living for their kids. They're trying to bring home a paycheck so they can pay rent, so they can pay their cars, so they can give their kids what we don't have right. or what we didn't have growing up. And so, you know, I just saw a lot of abuse, and I just really, really hung my head on that. I just thought, you know, I can really, really get behind this. And let's talk about let's talk about the lock and terror case. I mean, honestly, like I remember when you got into that case, I thought, what is the legal argument? I mean, it's a tough, tough case. You chose to take it on. Um, give us sort of a general background about what the case was, uh, what the theory of liability sure. was, and who the people were you were representing. Sure. So I had represented one of those clients a while back on, on, on a pedestrian case where he got hit by somebody and, and you know, I give my cell phone, whatever. <clears throat> one day he calls me out of the blue and he says, Mr. Espinosa, um, you know, um, I'm working at the La, La Cantera and, and I've been working there for like 10 years and we are the servers. All of us, are, you know, we're the servers and whenever you have like a quinceanera, a wedding, any event, we, we're the ones that serve you. We've never had any issues. Well, last November they brought in a new management company and they replaced all of our supervisors with Anglos. And they came in, they, they told us we can't speak Spanish. Is that legal? I was like, well, I mean, no, nothing is black or white. Why don't you come on in? Let me talk to you. Is, is it okay if some of my other friends come on in you know, with me? Sure. So before you know it, I had 24 people sitting in my conference Whoa. room telling me how they complained to management about how this isn't right, that they're not being allowed to speak in Spanish, which they've always spoke. And there was the manager's response was, well, this is America. You should speak English. God. And so, you know, that just made my blood boil <laughs> because, again, I could see my uncle. I could see my aunt. Yeah. They don't speak English but are very hardworking being told that. So then they said, well, we have a business necessity that these people speak English. And I said, well, you know, some of these people have been their supervisor for 15 years. And there's been no complaints. Right. So who's complaining other than this What's new the management? necessity? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and um, so I, I went, worked with one, one by one. We filed EEOC charges based on national or origin discrimination. And so what national origin discrimination is, if, if somebody discriminates on something that is uh, national to you, like natural to you, for example, it, you know, you think about an Indian person from India and they have a certain look, a certain... Uh, um, maybe accent, yeah. and people are making fun of their accent. Well, that's national origin discrimination. Sure. They can't help that. Sure. You know, and so with Spanish, na national origin, most of these people people only spoke Spanish. So that is national to them. That's natural to them. Yeah. And so if they're able to do their job and it's not a business necessity, you don't have to absolutely speak English to do this work, then there's absolutely no reason why you should discriminate against what okay. they're doing. And so we went to the EOC, we, we filed this charge, and a few months later, I get a call from somebody that says they're the investigator for the EEOC. And, and this is probably not politically correct, So you, <laughs> we're gonna, but you know, I, I get a call, and this guy says, you know, Mr. Espinosa, I, I need to meet with every one of your clients. And, you know, this and, that, and I'm thinking, if the investigator speaks worse English than my clients, <laughs> this is a good thing. <laughs> Was it an Hispanic guy? It was, yeah. it was. And he was amazing. He was great. We would joke. We would laugh. He was a good, good guy. He came in, met with all my clients. Because process-wise is you have to go through the EEOC yeah. process before you can file a lawsuit. For a discrimination yeah. claim, you can. Yeah. And so, you know, the the, invest, the the attorneys got involved. And when Trump won, I started getting a bunch of calls from my clients saying, hey, this is taking a long time. I don't think that Trump's going to care about yeah. doing anything for us. So I remember getting requesting to the attorneys, I want the right to sue letter. I'm just going to file this private lawsuit with yeah. or without you guys. And I remember having a call from the attorneys, the EEOC attorney saying, look, we're very interested in this case. We think this could be a game changer. Give us some time. And so we did. 
And they actually ended up finding uh, costs, which in, in the EOC world, discrimination claim c- cases, when they find costs, they mean that they found enough to warrant that there may have been some discrimination okay. there that they want to address. And so what happens in that case is they file the lawsuit on behalf of the EEOC and we intervene because they actually represented one guy that never signed up with us, but they okay. filed it, it, the whole, but if they went through the litigation and they found 20 others, yeah. they can represent anybody that potentially got affected. We only represent the ones that actually signed a contract with us. Fair enough. So we intervene with them and, um, we, you know, we start mediating. And I remember having the attorney come down from Dallas, the defense attorney. And, you know, he's a nice guy, man. Nice guy from Jackson Walker. And I think it was Jackson Walker. And, and you know, Anglo guy and, and real cool guy. And, and I asked him, so tell me, Michael, h- how do you think it's going to play in San Antonio <laughs> in front of probably like Judge Rodriguez or Orlando <laughs> Garcia, one of those federal judges? To tell them that at La Cantera, no puedes hablar español. <laughs> <laughs> and he did exactly what you're did doing. Did he get it? He just laughed. Yeah, yeah. okay. He laughed, and, and, and he got it. He got it. So y'all got paid well. Yeah, we yeah. went round and round. It was public. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's $2.6 million. Yeah. So essentially, they were discriminated for about six months because as soon as we filed the EOC charge, it changed, and that management company got fired. I mean, they went above and beyond to, to make changes. But for which good for them? Yeah, no, it was great. Yeah. It's it's a much better outcome. Yeah. And, and and you know part of the settlement is they had to pay each one of my clients a lot of money, and then they they also are being supervised for three years by the federal government. Is that right? Yeah, they have oh, to have good all for you, these man. changes. They have to implement training, diversity training, all kinds of things that that, that have really made an impact uh, on that business. And by making an impact on that business and making it so public, I think it's made an impact on the community. The nation. I mean, if yeah. the feds have shown a willingness to get involved in that, that's going to make everybody think twice before they do that. Have you had any other calls from people going through the that same sort of, hey, my job is telling us we can only speak English? I have. Um, and, you know, the difficulty with these employment cases is you've got to have some pretty hard evidence. Yeah. And so if, if my client says, well, that manager told me I couldn't speak Spanish, and the manager comes in and says, no, I never did. I never said that. It makes, it's a, he said, she yeah. said, and it's very difficult. to. And in La Quintero, was there documents or is it just 25 people? No, there was write-ups. Oh, God. We had two or three of our clients that had write-ups speaking Spanish in the big room. Shut up. I mean, yeah, write-ups. We had emails. We had a big HR meeting where like all of them testified, the ones that were there. Yeah, I remember the manager saying that we should learn to speak English because this is America. Uh, I mean, it was like hardcore evidence. Where did this management company come from? Uh, Colorado, Denver, Colorado. Huh. Is that crazy? Not here. Yeah, no, crazy. They, and they're gone. They're they're no longer here. Um, and that was that was all over the news. And I remember being super happy for you and super happy for your clients because that's a that's a big structural win. It's a systemic win, I yeah. think, for workers across the board. Um, and the for other- a little kid that didn't speak English going into elementary school, it was a, a, a definitely a highlight of my life. Yeah, it has to be like real vindication. Yeah. Like, I mean, there really has to be this. I was marginalized as a child because I didn't speak English, and here I am getting two point six million dollars for a bunch of people because they can't speak English. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, you also, I don't remember if there was a lawsuit involved or something, but you injected yourself in city politics or county politics recently. Um, basically related to the wages for interns or for uh, council staff. I can't remember what it was. What was that case about? So it's not necessarily a case yet uh, because it's not been filed, but it was, um, I had a few, uh, a lot of them actually, uh, city council staff come and talk to me about um, their wages. They were being paid very different than city employees. They, they, and so, so here's the setup as I understand it. And again, we haven't filed a lawsuit, so I don't know a hundred percent, right? So please, let's talk about what's in the, the news. Disclaimer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my understanding is, if let's say Justin Hill runs for city council and you win, then the city, you know, depending on their budget, awards you let's say a million bucks for your staff. Mm-hmm. You, Justin Hill, has to go get your own employer identification number. Is that right? Hire yes, and hire your own staff. And you decide how you're going to pay them. Like an independent contractor. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And so to me, that presents a million issues. Because if one of your staff 
is driving to a Justin Hill for yeah. re-election <laughs> campaign and kills a family, you're the employer. They're not suing the city. They're suing Justin Hill yeah. city councilman. And so, you know, there's a huge conflict there. If one of those employees sues you for FLSA, you know, Fair Labor Standards Act, failure to pay overtime, you're the employer under the, 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 the IRS, not the city. And so, you know, I sent a, what I thought was a very nice and well-drafted letter to the city, city attorney, city council saying, you guys need to do something about this. This is not right. And, and some of these employees are doing wearing two, three hats and they're being underpaid. Yeah. Uh, some of the lower tiered staff is not being even paid uh, overtime for working 60, 70 hours because they're just being paid almost salaries. And uh, that, is this a, are there any other cities that do it this way? There are some, but most don't. Okay. There's different systems that Austin has, Houston has. Because I think in Congress, if you're elected, the feds give you X amount of budget for staff. So it's paid through the feds. You get to figure out how to split the pie. But if you get hired, you have to get hired <clears throat> through the federal or uh, whatever system, HR. GSA they have. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. HR. Mm -hmm. So other cities have the same thing. You know, you go through HR. HR says, Justin, here's a, you, want, you need a chief of staff. Here's 10 candidates we think are good for you because they've been vetted through the city sure. HR. Here they don't. You bring in whoever you want. <laughs> Is the county work that way too for commissioners? You know, that part I don't know. Okay. Because this was just for the city. And, and, you know, I think we have. So it's not resolved. I thought this whole thing had been resolved. No, not yet. Okay. I mean, they got a race. And I okay. think our letter probably threatening lawsuits and, and, and kind of addressing some of those issues or bringing to light some of those issues probably had some effect on the races that they got. And they're trying to be a little more fair to the city council people, staff. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's over. By far. Uh, I think there's other issues that are going to be going on, and I hope they change it. I think we've got great city council people, very progressive, good people. We've got a great leadership in yeah. our city. And I thought that this, um, I think if, if it had been other leadership, I may not have gotten involved because um, it's a tough case. It yeah. definitely is a tough case. And it's tough because a lot of those city council people are my friends. And I know them personally. And to get a letter from a friend saying, hey, if you don't do these changes, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't create the best, you know, uh, uh, love for But me. it's still structured that way. It is. Yeah. You know, but at the end of the day, man, um, and I had some friends tell me, why would you do that? Why would you take on the city council that way? And the people that you know that are your friends. And I told them, you know what, man? I started my career fighting for worker rights, and I will never, ever be ashamed of fighting for worker rights. I, th I think it's, I don't think... I think it's fantastic. It's funny. Um, there's an older lawyer here in town, and I remember him one day um, drunkenly shaking his fist at the idea that lawyers specialize now because a lawyer should be able to do any kind of case. A lawyer's a lawyer. And I remember thinking, what an old kook. But specializing when the law keeps changing, when the rules keep changing, when the focus keeps changing, when the legislation keeps changing, really allows you to be better and whatever you've chose and you've chosen something that i mean i really can't even think of a different i can't think of a, a corollary to you in another city where there's another law firm that has said we are the workers right law firm so i think it's just fantastic that you've chosen to do that and that, that kind of takes me to my next question you've you've hit on the case against la cantera and the non-english speakers um what are some of the more important cases you've worked on and i want to break this down personally which was the, which ones were the most important to you personally, and then which ones do you think were most important across the board for workers? Um, <clears throat> personally, I had a case that I actually lost that was very very deep uh, to me, and it was uh, you had I had a young female immigrant. Um, I won't even mention her name, but we had a very very uh, she was probably about nineteen or twenty, very pretty young Hispanic immigrant. She comes over. She's living with her aunt. Um, she There's a construction site across the street. She feels like she's got to make money. She's got to do something. So she walks over across the street and to this construction site and says, can I be an assistant, a helper? I'll work, whatever. So, sure. Of course, they see her. Say, yeah. So they start having her pick up trash, right? Well, pretty quickly, the superintendent see, puts an eye on her and and starts saying, you know what? I need, I need a personal assistant. Why don't you come with me? Help me out. Well, she's sitting in the truck where he's taking her everywhere. He starts putting his hand on her thigh takes her to his house, uh, shows her pornography, and uh, she's just trying to get away. He starts making all kinds of advances on her, really, really does horrible things to her. 
And she comes to me and, and she says, you know, this is what's going on. Um, you know, can I, is there anything I can do? So I draft a letter for her and say, you need to take your hands off her. Yeah. She gets fired. So we bring a sexual harassment lawsuit for her. She's undocumented. Um, in her deposition, we have two attorneys because I sued him individually. So he had an attorney and then he, I sued the company. And they start asking, well, what's your name? Well, how do we know that's your real name? Well, what's your social well, where are you from? You know, all these, so I just start instructing not to answer about her social, her citizenship status, her uh, social security number, sure. nothing like that. And um, she had provided a Mexican ID, which should have sufficed, but this was before the Texas Hughes case that came out of the Texas Supreme Court. Um, and so they stopped the deposition. They said, well, Mr. Espinosa, if you're not going to let her answer these questions, we're going to have to take this up with a judge. Let's take it up with a judge. We get into a big shouting match with these attorneys shut down the deposition. We go in front of, uh, back then it was Judge Saldana, who's now a county judge, but she was a district court judge back then. Oh, yeah. She was great. She heard our arguments as a judge. This has nothing to do with whether she was sexually harassed or not. We have a Mexican ID. This is who she is. They shouldn't have to get into all these things. Well, the judge agreed with me. Yeah. Denied their motion to compel. They mandamus her. and goes up to the Court of Appeals here in San Antonio. This was back in 2008, probably, 2009, mm -hmm. before we had the Court of Appeals that we have now. And they agreed with the defense. They said she has to answer who she is. She's got to identify herself because how do we know she is who she is? So this is about a year and a half process, right? We get back down. Um, we go down. I want to scope by the, the judge. You know, what does she have to answer? What exactly does she have to answer? Well, she's got to say if this is her social that she gave to this employer. She has to say if this is her real name. And all these things that were very, very personally identifying, right? So by the time... Of the first depot, that it's gone up to the Court of Appeals. And I remember calling Maldef. Maldef got involved in it. You know, uh, and they wrote an amicus brief. And um, by the time that we get back to taking her depot again, it was about a year and a half, almost two years later. By this time, she has married a U.S. citizen. She has a baby on the way. And she tells me, I'm trying to get my residency. Like, I'm trying to fix my papers. Yeah. Is this going to jeopardize my ability to do that I couldn't tell her yes or no. I was like, I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. It's your call. So she came in one day with her husband and writes me a letter saying, I'm instructing you to dismiss my lawsuit um, because of the fear she had yeah. of, of this. And and if I could only tell you the horrible things this man did to her and got away with it because she was undocumented, um, that is a case I have never forgotten. And I think it hurt even more because I lost because I had to dismiss it. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and just to know that somebody abused this poor worker, this poor lady that is trying to find a better <laughs> life for her kid and for herself and for, for her family, um, to be t abused this way, to be to get away with it, man, just still burns me inside. You know, I've, I worked a case in Oregon, and I represented two undocumented workers who were killed in a, uh, it was Connecticut in a, in a 18 wheeler crash. And up there, they were limited in their wage claim to what they would have made in their home country. So there are some states that are worse than Texas on this type of stuff. Texas is actually not terrible when it it's comes to undocumented workers. Under it's gotten the law. better. Yeah. yeah. It's gotten better, especially after that case that we took up, there was a case that came out of the Texas Supreme court that said citizenship really shouldn't have anything to do with it yeah. or, or your status shouldn't have anything to do with your claims. Because it shouldn't. It shouldn't. <laughs> you know, people you're say, You're a well, human, well, you're a you, human, you're a worker, you're a worker. People say, well, your wages, you wouldn't have made as many wages because you're not working here legally. And I told them, well, when he got injured, he was working. Yeah. <laughs> so he had the ability to earn wages, yeah. whether he was here legally or not. He was actually obviously working. Right. You know, so. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, so 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 that is definitely a case that has impacted me uh, a, a lot. The Cantera case has been a success that I was very happy that I'll never forget. And then right now we're currently about to file a lawsuit where one of our clients is has mental health issues and is work, walking down the street on Potranco. And there is some evidence that he was stopped by the sheriff and there's some issues with mental health issues. But at some point he gets picked up by the Customs and Border Patrol, gets to, gets processed through the, um, I think it's in Atascosa County, uh, uh, one of the agencies there, <clears throat> gets deported to to Nuevo Laredo gets abducted by the cartel, gets tortured. The parents over here get the FBI involved. After a week, they finally release him and he gets sent back. Thank God he's lived, but he's got mental I issues completely from that. Well, the whole time we find out he had a Texas ID on him. 
with a Texas driver's license. I mean, a Texas ID with a Texas address on him, on his person. They just ignored it? I guess. This happened about a year and a half ago here in San Antonio. So who's the case against? U- the USA. I mean, the, the U.S. Okay. government. And so and so we filed our, our Form 95 um, form. You know, we've got to go through this administrative process. If they don't answer, they don't respond. They don't try to get it settled. Now we're going to settle. We're just going to file it and see what I, I want to know what they did. I want to know what they, what happened. Why did they <laughs> ignore that Texas ID with yeah. a Texas? Dr- How can you get a Texas ID if you're not here legally? A valid Texas ID. Yeah, right. Um, what do you think is next for your practice? Where do you think y'all are going? Um, I, uh, you mentioned earlier, you don't know of a, of a, I guess, similar type firm that fights so much for worker rights yeah. in any other city. Uh, I, my goal is to be the worker rights firm in Texas. Uh, Good. I'd like to open up an office in Austin soon, uh, maybe El Paso later and who knows, maybe Dallas and Houston in the, in the far future, but I would, what would definitely- you look for in Austin? I mean, tons of white collar workers in Austin. Have you been to Austin's construction sites? I mean, there is the construction, yeah, but... I, I drive to Austin. There's a, a a crane, there's forklifts, there's construction in every other corner of that city. And when you look in there, all those people are brown. Well, it's all yes. immigrants, all Hispanics. So that market... But there's no blue-collar work other than the construction, which is yeah. kind of boom and bust. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, okay. and, and that's 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 great. I've got good judges there. Uh, very, it's, it's, it's a blue county, uh, great... Uh, people, you know, uh, some odd changes in the primaries that just happened there. What do you, I, I, I'm, I'm you not, know, there were some, you know, every, uh, the primaries were different this time around. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, sure, sure. For yeah. sure. For uh-huh. sure. Um, okay. I'm going to look at sort of what the last things I had written down were. Um, you, another, the last thing I was sort of want to ask you about is you're kind of an amateur or a, uh, you're dabbling in development. You're dabbling in purchasing real estate. Um, what parts of town do you like? What parts of town do you like to put your money in? Your office is not far from mine. So let's just talk. What do you think about this central San Antonio corridor? You, you and I have both bought real estate here. I live over here. What do you think is going to happen in sort of the San Pedro corridor? Um, I think that's definitely a booming area. The Woodlawn Theater area is, is, is booming. Oh, yeah. I think Fredericksburg is going to boom. I've oh, got what are you talking about Woodlawn? Want to, Woodlo- is Woodlawn over where the uh, Panaderia is? Yeah, yeah, Panaderia. Okay. Yeah. So Panaderia. tell us about that. So so my father-in-law's a baker, and, and he came here about two years ago, and we offered to help him open up his uh, Panaderia Jimenez. And, and it's at 18, 1844 Fredericksburg, and I own that building, actually. Okay. On, on Fredericksburg, I had the real estate, and I told him, why don't you put your bakery there? And, and him and his brother came in, and best Mexican – pan dulce you know that you're ever gonna have we had some delivered here two weeks ago from there yeah it's good right (laughs) it's great yeah good good stuff so so i love that area i love um san pedro i've got a building on san pedro i've got 281 410 um i think real estate is a really really good investment for anybody that that comes into a little bit of money and and wants to put it into something like my old mentor jim sure told me you can put money in the stock market and somebody else is managing it. You have no idea what's going to happen. Things beyond your control, um, control it. He goes, you buy a piece of real estate, you can drive by it. You can insure it. You can paint it. You can very rarely is real estate going to depreciate. He goes, so it's one of the safest investments you can make. You can lease it out. And, and, and it's, I mean, think about it. If, if you get to a point where you've got enough real estate you're, that you're living off rents, you don't have to be here because you pay somebody to manage it and you can be living in San Miguel de Allende, which is my dream. <laughs> and, and you know, you're just living off rents. Yeah. It's not like a business that you actively have to be involved in day to day, week to week. You either get the monthly check or you don't. And if there's a problem, you've got a management company that takes care of it. So you seem to have like a real passion towards mentoring people that came from um, backgrounds in which they don't have a mentor opportunity. Um, is there any way people could... I mean, is there a plan for you to expand your ability to mentor or get involved in a mentorship uh, angle in sort of a larger way? Sure. Um, you know, I'm actually working on um, Instagram video type deal, YouTube video uh, that's going to be Latinx mentor. Um, now, I'm targeting Latin, Latino and Latina kids just because that's where I'm sure. from. But it's not exclusive to Latino kids. It's really underprivileged kids. Yeah. Um, and, and so hopefully I can get that launched. Does it have a title? Um, Latinx mentor. Okay. Um, and Latinx, my daughter would get mad if I say Latinx. It's Latinx mentor. 
Um, and that's going to be a YouTube channel, an Instagram channel, probably Facebook channel as well. And what I really am hoping to do is just do three to five minute videos with very, very uh, successful people that have come from underprivileged backgrounds sure. um, and have kids hopefully have that, you know, that that spark the way I did when I saw Henry Cisneros. And yeah. because I've seen the power of a role model, because I've seen the power of seeing somebody that looks like you succeed, um, I don't think it's going to be wasted time, effort, or money to, to put successful people uh, where other young kids can see them and say, I mean, I can be like that person. So I have a, another mic here, which I plan to do certain things with, but whenever you get that up and running, I'd love for you to come on with somebody that you also think has a compelling story. And let's sort of talk about a year into it, what y'all have learned and what y'all think y'all provide for people and what you've heard back from people who are listening to it. Yeah, that'd be yeah. awesome. Um, Javier, we try to keep these around an hour. You and I have gone long a little bit, <laughs> uh, but thank you for being on here. Honestly, you've, you've got, You've got a compelling story personally, but I think people are more defined by what they do day to day. And you are, you are living a compelling life day to day, representing people that I'm sure those people would have had 10 law firms hang up on them. And I think other, I, I think listeners who aren't lawyers don't realize that's not a case anybody else probably other than you would have taken the law Cantera one, for example. And I think it's fantastic what you do. I think you make our, our city better. You improve our community, you make people's lives better. And Thank you for being here. I appreciate you very much, man. Thank you. I'm very proud of what you're doing here with this podcast too, man. I think well, it's amazing. You. And I've told you that many times. Yeah, I know. Thank it's you great. very much. I appreciate it. Encouragement actually helps a lot for, yeah. you know, doing something different. Uh, so that's going to do it for this episode of the Alamo Hour. A uh, big thank you to Javier Espinoza. We're going to have this up. We're going to have more information from him when he has his Latinx and Latina X uh, mentor program up. We'll post that on our website as well. Uh, you can learn more about Javier and his law firm at www.espinosafirm.com. All right. Uh, join us on our next episode. Uh, our guest wish list continues right now. We've got Coach Pop, who I think is probably never going to get off the list. Uh, <laughs> Shea Serrano, Ron Nuremberger, Ron Nuremberg. So if you all know them, tell them to come on the show. Uh, Ron, I've, you know, we've, we talk about it, but you haven't pulled the trigger yet. So come on. Um, thank you all for joining and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Alamo Hour. You are all what make this city so great. We hope you join us next week. In the meantime, subscribe to our podcast. Check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Alamo Hour or our website, alamohour.com. Until next time, Viva San Antonio.